All right. So let's get into the Word. How many are ready to get into the Word? Amen. I'll do like one of those guys on TV. This is my... No. <laughs> but you bring your... Friend, yeah, I know. Bring your Tanax. I mean, bring your Bibles. Some of you have it electronically. Some of you have it uh, any, any shape or form. Obviously, uh, we lost contact with turning pages. But guess what? The power goes, see, hey, you better have one of these available. See, this never fails. <laughs> hey, no power outage here. Hmm. No pun intended. <laughs> the power behind the word as well. So this is the Torah portion starting in Exodus chapter 6, which uh, Sarita read some of it this morning, uh, verse 2 through chapter 9, verse 35. And the uh, Torah, half Torah portions, you got Ezekiel, there's also a reference there of Isaiah. And there's several Brick Tadashas that we can uh, use as reference. We do have the Luke that was read um, this morning or this afternoon, but we also have there a reference to 2 Corinthians in the book of Romans. There is a lot in this Torah portion. I think I say that every Shabbat, right? Okay, so I'm going to repeat it again. There is a lot <laughs> in this Torah portion. I mean, we can't really dig into all that we need to do, but that's what, how good it is. I mean, we get every year, we get to do it all over again, and something else comes out. See, the word keeps giving. But the outline is important. We did start with initially with God's promises and action. Uh, it d does go into the heads of uh, people of Israel, and then it talks about how Hashem will lay his hand on Egypt. And this is not like any laying of hands. He said, I'm going to lay your, my hands on you. You know, this is some heavy hand that is going to come up on Egypt. We have the battle of the snakes. And then we go through seven of the ten plagues uh, that we find in Egypt. The water and blood, frogs, gnats, insects. Epidemics of the livestock, boils, and hail. And uh, you can pick any of those and uh, run with it, and we'll be here a while. But today, before we get into it, we're just going to do what we do every week. The last few weeks, we cover things like all the way to by you guys, where we talk about what, what are the things that drive you as an individual, what's your motivating, what gives you the strength to do what you need to do on a daily basis. In other words, what is your meaning? What is your purpose? We also talked just like last week that if you have these things in order, you must have some sort of identity you identify to. And if you have a question in identity, that is a big issue. Big issue because you don't have a foundation to where to start with. You have to have identity. Who you identify with? Then we talked about this little item here about leadership. How leadership is very both not only influential in your life, but it's also there for the purpose of not only guiding you, but instructing you and helping you along the way as those challenges come. And we also put out a question out there, are you able to be an agent of Hashem, regardless of your circumstances in your workplace? your home, wherever, in your families, are you able to be a special agent? 007. A sheliach. That's what Rav Shaul was. An emissary. An emissary of the good news of the gospel. So that's how we ended last week. But this week, in today's Torah portion, we are going to continue to look into a little bit into Moshe's interaction here with Pharaoh. See, in this interaction, he's requesting the freedom of the Jewish people, or what's going to become the Jewish people, to exert their worship practices, their rights to worship Hashem. In other words, to exert their faith in freedom. It is the kind of freedom that some countries in the world right now cannot do freely. Freedom of religion. This country is protected under the Constitution. 
quote. I just don't know for how much longer they'll be protected under the Constitution. Okay? So, you see, Egypt, if you look in history, Egypt had no single belief system at that time. At this time, but Moshe was there. The Egyptians, you know, share a very complex series of local deities until it finally evolved into a national type of religion, but it was much later. So serving and practicing religion was an ever-evolving in Egypt, and in a sense, it was protected. You know that? Pharaoh was okay. Okay, so you practice over there your religion. It's okay. I mean, the Jews were able to do this even that much later when they were in Babylon as well. But in Egypt also, they were had this kind of freedom of religion, so to speak, until some things change. So, whoops. There we go. In the U.S., although our nation was established by our founding fathers with the Judeo-Christian values in mind and under one God, and with this protection offered under the Constitution, like this Torah portion that we find here, the issue of being able to practice your faith has become a matter of national attention. And Pharaoh is getting in the way. Do you notice how the Torah parallels the world? Today, we're finding more and more that is becoming a matter of national concern, the practice of religion, specifically in large groups. This is considered a large group. In some states, can't even do it. It's an issue. As we spoke last week, the descendants of Yaakov had become very numerous and powerful in the land and thus brought the jealousy and the envy of the Egyptians who subjugated them and submitted them to slavery. See? Okay, so let's bring that home. You do things well. You're righteous. You do things by the book. You're prosperous. You grow. And somebody who doesn't, who might not even work as hard as you do, who doesn't do what it requires, but wants what you have. You see, it works the same way. It works just as it was in Egypt for us to realize that the Hebrews or the Jewish people at that time in, in Egypt were subjugated because of these things. They were rising, they were rising. Hashem was giving them favor. And that brought the world against them. In order to understand how today's Torah portion begins, we must be connected to last week's Torah portion, Shemot, and how it ended. And this is how it ended. See, that's why in the Sefer, in the scroll, there's no chapters or verses. It just goes on. Because in verse 1 it says, And the Lord said to Moshe, You shall soon see what I will do to Pharaoh. He shall let them go because of the greater might. Indeed, because of a greater might, he shall drive them from the slam. In other words, Hashem is letting Moshe know that he himself is about to reveal himself. Bringing the purposes into play of why they were going through what they were going through for so many years. Letting mankind know he is Adonai. He is in charge. Immediately he reveals himself in a way to Moshe like 
never before to any of the patriarchs. Do you know how he did that? She read it when she read out the uh, Sefer Torah. By the Aver Elohim El Moshe, Vayomer Elaf Ani, my name. He reveals himself. This is a new revelation of God Almighty Hashem to Moshe. And he goes on to say, hey, they did not know me like you're knowing me right now. So God is progressively revealing himself to his people. And he has done it from the beginning on how he goes on in each time he reveals himself in a special way. But to Moshe, he's letting him know, hey, we've got two different attributes of Hashem here. One is his proper name, and one that you see in creation, Elohim. Okay? Created God, merciful God. So, I thought that all this time that he had been speaking to Moshe, that Moshe knew him. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, he must have been missing something. Because he said, I really need to let you know who I am. <laughs> yes, I came to you in the bush, in the burning bush, and I said, I am who I am. I will be where I will be. But this attribute is encompassed in all that. It's in my proper name. You will see it, and it's significant. It's a revelation given to motion, <clears throat> and only to him, for a purpose. He goes on to tell him that obviously the patriarchs knew him as El Shaddai. You know what El Shaddai means? It comes from the word in Hebrew, Shaddai. Oh, he knows. <laughs> yes, it's actually like nursing. It's a motherly type. You know, very motherly type. But this one, this is a different attribute in his name. He said, the prevailer one, now, the one that's been sustaining you is revealing himself as the eternal one. The one who, once you're gone out of here, will continue to sustain every generation that comes after you. It's a little bit different because Moshe, I'm telling you that this is the name that, came, that brought everything into existence and is going to make sure that at the end every single word and promise that I gave will be fulfilled. And I'm giving the reassurance under my name. What does it bring to my mind the word that said, on his name every knee shall and every tongue shall confess. So he's bringing the name generationally because he's eternal. And he's letting Moshe know, he said, it doesn't matter if you're here. It doesn't matter if any of these descendants said, I made a promise to Abraham. And he never saw it being fulfilled, did he? Or I made a promise to Yitzhak. He never saw that promise being fulfilled. Or to Yaakov. It doesn't mean that he can't have faith that he will fulfill him. But I'm letting you know, Moshe, I'm revealing myself to you this way because it is your duty to pass it on because they have perfect faith. You have to bring those into that realm by teaching them. I said, for Abraham, he said, I did not make myself known to them by my name. He did not receive that revelation like Moshe did here. The interesting thing is that this happened just, if you look one verse before that, 
Moshe is over there complaining to Hashem. Complaining. What is wrong with you that these people still got to go through this? Nobody here complains to Hashem, right? Why do I have to go through this? I'm still suffering. I'm still subjected to this abuse. In my home, in my job, or wherever it is. And right after that, he said, no, 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 let me show you who I am. And he gives him a new revelation right here. This attribute of justice is in his name. The attribute that he needed to understand before everything that's coming down. Right after this, after this revelation of his name, there is, like say, the hand of Hashem is going to be on Egypt. See? He said, I will reward those who walk in my ways. And he sent Moshe to Pharaoh. What? To bring the promises that he had given Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to come to pass. He said, wait a minute. Because for them, it, it appeared impossible. That's the, within the revelation of that name. He said, for them, it would have been very, very difficult to accept based on their experiences, that Hashem was going to be able to fulfill those promises. And here we are, how many years afterwards, given to Abraham, Isaac, now Yaakov. Abraham, 400 years plus. But back in Genesis 3.17, Adonai told him, rise, Abraham, walk the land through its length and through its breadth, for you... For to you I will give it. Yet, when his wife died, what happened? He had to purchase the land from a Hittite. Because he had no inheritance. So you have faith. So in spite of your circumstances, he said, oh, God promised me that. Why isn't it happening right now? Well, if it's Hashem who promised to you, have to wait. Because he knows the timing and he knows the perfect time. Even if you're past. If you promise that you save your children, you're going to have to trust. See, he had to purchase the land in order to bury his own wife and had an inheritance. He told Isaac in Genesis 26, 3, said, remain in the land, for to you and your offering I will give all the territories. Yet, Isaac himself, when he needed water, and he started, what, trying to dig out wells to find water. You remember that incident? He could not even find a land to dig out water or a well. And even after they had dug a well, he had to fight people that are trying to fill the well so he won't have them. That's after he told them, hey, remain in the territory. I promise that Hashem gave him. Yaakov is another example. He told Yaakov, the land upon which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants, back in Genesis 28, 13. But Yaakov himself then needed, when he needed land, he needed to pitch his tent or live. He needed to pay for the land 100 coins. He didn't have an inheritance, back in Genesis 33, 9. Why am I bringing all these things? Because Moshe is in the middle of this Back and forth with Pharaoh. What is Pharaoh a symbol of? Do you know? What's his symbol? Pharaoh is a ruler of the world. So if Pharaoh is a ruler of the world, he's a symbol of the world kingdom. That's a kingdom. Okay? And here comes the emissary from who? Hashem. Representing his name. I love this song. I, I, I sing it all the time. My wife knows. 
is, is, is a song made by New Song. Actually, we wear his name. Moshe was wearing Hashem's name as his representative. And actually, the word says that when he spoke, it was God speaking. Right? So here he finds himself as his representative. And he knows that the hand of Hashem will be upon Egypt. And even though we don't understand everything that Hashem or God is doing in our life when he does it or he promises and we need to have faith, we need to know that in our thoughts are not like his. He lives outside of time and space. So we question sometimes how he comes about doing these plans is that he must not know me at all. See? I have a young lady today told me, say, I don't know if I'm doing what God wants me to be doing. I don't feel close to him. I'm, you know, and all these things jumping into their minds. That's the world. The world is going to be your battleground each and every day. So it's unavoidable. What you need to understand is how you can combat the world. You see, that's exactly how Moshe was here. And his revelation that he found in Egypt about the world. We know that right here, right here, is the essence of the story of Passover. It begins right here between Exodus 6. Hashem promising the redemption of his people. But he's letting Moshe know that this is the God of eternity who is performing the miracles now and who will forever be performing them before the people. Because the bottom line is, and the question is, you are going to might be over, some people believe we're under a quote-unquote plague. The question is, are you going to be in Moshe's position? Moshe's position of what? Having a guarantor, which is Hashem, finding that he's the eternal God, that he will make his promises, or you are going to be in a place but the young lady is in the place of doubt. And don't know where to go. See, he said in these verses that follow here, Genesis 6, he said, he will free you, he will take you, he will redeem you, and he will plant you in his land. That was a promise for the Jewish people. Then, and it's the same for you and I now. Through Messiah Yeshua, we have access to exactly the same thing. The prophet Micah spoke about this as we read in Micah 7, 14 through 15. It says, lead your people. It says, lead your people with your rod, the flock of your inheritance who dwell alone, a forest in the midst of a fruitful field, and they shall graze in Basham and Gilead as in the days of yore. As in the days of your exodus, days of your exodus in plural, from the land of Egypt, I will show him wonders. Now Micah, here is the very first one and only one that describes the exodus in plural. Why would he do that? Maybe it's because there was more than one exodus. He's not talking about only Egypt. He's talking about Every single one of those exodus that Hashem br has brought his people out. His faithfulness throughout the generations. Do you see the connection there? And he's able, and this is the same revelation that Moshe received here. He's revealing that future generations. I keep having a pop up here of a Wi-Fi. I'm going to turn that off. <laughs> Bothering me. Turn that off. Okay. Every future re revelation of these generations have come from what Moshe was given right here. It also means that all the days since they left Egypt, Hashem has been revealing himself, like I said earlier. After leaving Egypt, we have to uh, receive a revelation from Hashem. He's revealing himself every day. Every day to us, after leaving Egypt, is a revelation. You've got to understand that in our life, if we... 
lose revelation, we lose the very first thing that we pointed out in this verse. You cannot see. You don't have vision. Revelation means vision. No revelation, no vision. My people perish because of lack of knowledge. knowledge. And knowledge comes why? Because they have the vision to seek him. If you don't have the stamina to go after him and to see him, to seek him for what it is, this is what the promise is. You won't find him. There will be no revelation in your life. He said, and there will be no way for you to come out from Egypt. You can't come out from that exile, okay? It says here, e the Egypt is always the resemblance of that first, very first big exile of the Jewish people. But all of it was necessary because they came out of Egypt and they were going where? To the promised land, supposedly. Took a while to get there, right? A whole bunch of 40 years. But that was necessary too. They were getting Egypt out of them. And they had received what in the process? The Torah. You see, I can't walk or any job. How many here here have a job? Baruch Hashem, do you have a job? If we don't, we have to pray for you so you get one. <laughs> if you need one. If you're doing something, when you walk in there your first day, okay? I've been have, I have all this education, but now I need to do what? Learn how to do my job. I need instructions. This is your manual right here. I want to know how to walk and uh, his promises and know what to do. Hey, you got the manual right here. This is what gives you the guidance. This is the Torah. And it starts with the Torah. It doesn't start after Matthew. It doesn't start after that little white page. It starts right there. Genesis 1.1. That's your instruction. So they needed to receive because the Torah was given to what? To the believer. The Torah wasn't given to the world. It was given to the people that were set apart. The people that were redeemed. It was given to them after they were taken out through freedom, redeemed. They didn't quite make it to the land. They were on their way to the land, but they needed to get rid of some things in the process. So the Torah was given. It was necessary. So it was necessary for that Torah to come in order for Mashiach to come. You realize that. It was necessary for that Torah to be given for Mashiach to come the first time. And it is now as imperative for, it be, for his return. So you need to stay focused. Hashem is about to reveal himself again. In this time. Just like he did to Moshe. Again in this time. So what is your responsibility? Get ready. Get ready. Get in the word. Get strengthened. Because in order for you to see beyond, and this is spiritual vision, not worldly vision. You need to see the revelation in his name like Moshe did. You need to be able to see the physical and see the burning bush and see the eternal one. When you see the eternal one, no amount of fear can come your way. No amount of fear is said, oh, okay, so this is coming my way, you see, but I have the eternal one in me. I have the eternal promises. I, I know where I'm going. Where are you going? How do you know? So Revelation. Find ourselves in Egypt again, huh? And this picture here is more common than you realize because it has some elements there. And I bring this illustration just to show you how the accuser of the brethren works. 
You know who that is, right? Okay. It is written here in the Torah until this very day, and it happens, the patterns and the methods of the accuser of the brethren have not changed. You see them here in the Torah, they have not changed. So the terms found in Exodus 7, 9, 10, and 12 is this term here on top. You want, you want to try that word? Tanin. 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 Okay. Which means what? Serpent. Right? It can mean sea or river monster. It could mean dragon. It can be venomous snake. But look. How did those came out? It says here in... Chapter 7, verse 9, when Pharaoh speaks to you and says, produce your marvel, signs, you shall say to Aaron, take your rod, cast it down before Pharaoh, and it shall turn into a, tani, tani, a serpent. Hmm. It's interesting. The first thing that Pharaoh will ask is for a sign. The first thing that the world will ask from you is a sign. You only have one sign. I told you about wearing the name. The sign is Yeshua, the Messiah, lighting from you to the world. That's the only sign you need. You don't need to give any more signs. You don't need to make any special focus, focus or whatever it is you want to do. But it says here, the first thing they ask, I need to see a sign. I need to see the sign of your power, whoever you're representing. What kind of power is in behind it? It says... So I can get the proof. Let me see if your God is real or powerful. So Hashem instructs Moshe to use his rod. And this is very important. It wasn't just any object. See the staff or rod in ancient civilizations like Egypt in this time was very special. Why? In it, it contained the hieroglyphics of power. They thought there was magic in the rod of Pharaoh. See? So Hashem took all their symbolism and said, no, I'm going to show you the real power. The scripture shows that even in that same kind of descriptions, he describes David Hamelech's kingdom. He said, the scepter will not leave his right hand. The scepter, the rod, the staff, the right hand, the power, as you see here in the picture of Pharaoh. And this is not any common power, because even in ancient Egypt it says this is divine power, what they're referring to. So something out of outside time and space, something that comes from above, something supernatural. So God knew this. And you use it to demonstrate his divine authority and rulership. How? Well, see, I told you the world is going to use the same methods have been using here from Egypt. The sorcerers were going to do what? After this was commanded, the sorcerers from the courts of Pharaoh were going to do what? Do the same thing? The word says. Well, it's interesting how it's described in actual Hebrew. Because it says, oh, their staff also produced serpents. Well, wait a minute. The, stora, the Torah stops. Because it doesn't say, Vayahi Latanaim. It actually uses another term. And in that, Rabino Bakia says, he explains that it was almost like using the words that in, the, in, in Joshua 7, 5, where it says their hearts melted into water. It was an idiomatic type of speech, saying they weren't like serpents, but they weren't real. See how you play games in the, in the Hebrew? They said they were like serpents, but they weren't real. See, in their magic, in their way to fool your eyes, it was only an appearance off. No creative power behind them. Only Hashem has that. 
Or they can fool your eyes. Create an optical illusion. So it's to say that people were, you know, again, Joshua says, well, they were, their hearts melted into the water. It's just saying a way to say that, you know, they were just losing. They were being discouraged. Well, right here, what you see here is the description of these sorcerers who may believe that they did exactly what Moshe did and his brother did, throwing the rod on the ground and creating, and God created the serpent. Produced that illusion. So much so that in verse 12, they say, cast, each cast down their rods and they turn into serpent. But Aaron's rod swallowed the rods. Hmm. Interesting. Again here, the word in Hebrew changes. It says in Shemot Rabbah 9.7, speaking about this passage, that... Pharaoh saw and observed this happening and reflected that it might be himself who was being swallowed by Hashem's rods and his kingdom. But look how it changed from serpents to rod. He didn't say the serpent of Aaron swallow the other serpents. It says the rod. So the first thing you got to remember is, one, deception. So that's the biggest weapon the enemy has against you. He will create a distraction and deception. They were like serpents, but not real serpents. So that's the most powerful weapon the enemy has in hand against you. So much so that Torah portions in the words, back in verse 15, instead of, Tananim uses Nahash. Anybody know what Nahash is? Serpent. And all he's doing by getting those two terms there is to say, hey, this is the same guy that was in what? In Genesis 3, who deceived Chava to eat out of the tree of knowledge and evil. The same Nahash. It's just making it look, it's creating an illusion, but it's the same one. So in the Hebrew, it gives you a hint. It went from to Nahash, just indicating as it, he's a master of deception. Now, when he came to Chava, he said to her, did God really tell not to eat out of every single tree? The seed is there. He created a doubt in her mind, and it grew. It's the same way he operates today in you and I. He is the same serpent in the garden, and he is the same one here operating with the sorcerers making the people believe that there is power behind Pharaoh just as much as in Hashem. Now, in verse 15, it goes on to say that of this same chapter, it says, Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is coming out of the water and station yourself before him at the edge of the Nile, taking with you the rod... Here's where he reveals it. The rod, what did I say the rod was? Power, supernatural. Taking the rod that you turn into a snake. And he uses the word Nahash in verse 15. He said, I know who you are, but I hold the power. See? And when he threw that rod, and he ate all the apparent snakes. He said, he has the power over the enemy. Who do you think he is? He's a gem. He has the power over everything. Do you believe that? Amen. He said, you've got to understand that the enemy is basically, who created him? The Lord did. He has the power over him. He can only do 
say or act if he allows it and honor his command. Even in Gematria, do you know the value in, the in Gematria of the word Nachash? You know Gematria, numerology. Numbers in, in the Hebrew letters have numbers. Nachash has a value of 358. Guess what the value for Mashiach is? Anybody? 358. So it's like looking at one coin. Good? Any of Don't miss the revelation of God's power. And lose perspective like the enemy's working out there on their own. Doing whatever he feels like it. No, he only does whatever you allow him. So deception. We don't go to deception right now. Well, this famous thing that we keep hearing, this phrase now, fake. I'm not going to use the term. Everybody kind of answer it back. Fake. <laughs> you know, I go, <laughs> I go, I go to the, um, to the Winn-Dixie to buy uh, kosher food. And, uh, and when I go, for those people, how many here confess they used to like bacon? It's okay. It's okay. You're not there anymore. You're being washed. You, you know. Okay. Bacon is a style of how they do the meat, okay? Okay, so we know pork is not kosher, so that's out of the picture. But they got this place here in which you go, and you can buy fake on. <laughs> it's called fake on. It's beef, but made on a bacon style. You like that? Kosher, beef, rabbit stamp and everything. But that's kind of how what you see here. Deception is like fake on. It's faking everybody out to see what way are you going to go? Huh? Are you going to accept this as the real thing? It's the appearance. The question is, what is your defense? What is your defense to all this nonsense and fake going around? So how do you distinguish what's the truth and what's not true? I should go to channel no. <laughs> this other channel, no. This other website, no. What is your defense? I'm going to give you just a few just to refresh your memory of what deception is all about. Because the Bible has a lot to say about deception, and you wonder why. 2 Timothy 4.34. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. Check. <laughs> but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to soothe their own passions. Double check. And will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. A lot of people fishing out there in the myths. Oh, Yes. You know, I read the latest book, and it says the, you know, the rainbow came from some other place and some other cockamamie stuff. Here's another one. The coming of the lawlessness one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. Hey, these are the signs of the world. And with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. What's the, what's the truth? The word. the word. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion. See, there's a lot of delusional people walking around. None of them are here. But you see it right there in the word. I don't make it up. It's right here in the Word. It says, Hashem himself sends a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false. I can tell somebody, I can present him facts, and they say, I don't see it. 
in order that, may be, that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. 2 Thessalonians 2. Give you another one. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty, what? Deceit, deception. According to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Mashiach. Colossians 2. See, this is not new. Deception. Understanding this, that in the last days, how many believe you're in the last days? So did they. For, for Hashem one day is like a thousand years. So did them. They believe in the last day. It says, comes times of difficulty for people will be lovers of selves. We don't see that. Lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unimpassable, slanderers without self-control, brutal, not loving, good, treacherous, reckless. Whew, these have a lot of attributes here. Swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of Hashem, having the appearance of godliness. But denying his power. So how do you deny God's power? Hey, I go to Shabbat. I'm there every Shabbat. As soon as I leave, come Sunday, oh God. I don't know what to do with myself. I don't, I don't know what I'm doing in the world. Oh God. If you can only come today Doubt. Deception. What does it say in the last? This is the hard one. Oy, obey, huh? Oy, obey. Avoid such people. See? Such people will what? Will do and plan in you and bring you down. With them. They say, no. Come up. Lift them up with a word. Lift it up. You're not going to stay there. I say, here's my hand. You want to come up? I'll show you. Oh, boy. Not dragging me in the hole. You want more to reinforce this? It says, it performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people and by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast. It deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. The enemy. D deception. So I brought you passages from Torah. I brought you passages from the Brit Chalich, huh? from all the way to Revelation. It's not change. The question is, what is your defense? Right? What is the antidote? We already saw one. The word, Torah. Torah is your antidote. I'm telling you what. Take two a day and call me in the morning. <laughs> right? That's what the, the, the doctor will say. Oh, take two of these a day and call me in the morning. You'll be fine. Hey, if you take two minutes. This is a good antidote. It says here, the commandments. So, if you take the Torah and you take the commandments into your eye, you apply them, it's an antidote. And everything in the Word blesses Ruach HaKodesh, His Holy Spirit. Now, now you got the power. You got the Word, you got the Ruach. You're putting the whole armor on, Ephesians 2. And now you can act. And you need community. Or are you a lonely soldier? You need an antidote. Apply these. They're the same ones that were applied back then to Moshe. Say, they didn't come out of Egypt by themselves one at a time. They came out as what? a multitude together. So 
so this is to show you that we use, and some people say, well, you go through every, every year through, all, you know, through the same stuff, reading the Torah. Mm-hmm. It's the Word of God. It's alive. You see? But every year it keeps giving. Every year that Torah is made alive in your time, in your space, in your week. Apply this. Proverbs 2, 1 through 7. It says, my son, if you will receive my words and store my commands inside of you, paying attention to wisdom, inclining your mind towards understanding. Yes, if you will call for insight and raise your voice for discernment. If you seek, as you will seek silver and search for it, as for a hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of Adonai and find knowledge of God. For Adonai gives wisdom from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Huh? Knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. I always have those three. It's not the Trinity. Okay? Don't get it confused. For God has many emanations. God has many manifestations. Yes, he did made himself flesh and dwell among us for a purpose. But he's one. It's like he's a husband, he's a father. See? It's the same person. He can be many. So Hashem is the one that provides wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. You need them all. And if you do Torah, you follow his commandment, if you read his word, and you seek his, his spirit will be there. He will impart knowledge, Wisdom, understanding, and a sound mind. Do you want to know how many wackos are right there? You already know there's too many to count. Because they don't have Torah. They don't have the center. They don't have the foundations. You can bring that. Because they give an opportunity to share that. But you have to be the example. See? You can't, have, you can't be the appearance. You have to walk the walk and talk the talk. Amen? Amen? Amen. Uh, let's pray. Let's stand and pray. Amen. Shabbat Shemayim, Father, thank you for the revelation, the revelation of your Son in our lives, the revelation that Teach us each and every day that there's only but one way. It's through Messiah Yeshua, it's through your word, that we all come to you. For Father, you had laid out the plan and the promises before the foundations of the world, Father, for redemption for each and every individual. For it's up to us to take a hold of it, receive it, and run with it, run towards you. Father, may we understand that even in peril times that your ways are not our ways that we can understand and have faith and endure until the end. B'Shem Yeshua, we pray. Amen. Amen. Eloheinu v'elohei avotenu barakeinu v'beraka hameshul shet b'torah haketuva al yedei Moshe avdeka ha'amura mepi aharon uvanav kohanim am kedoshaka ka'amur our God and the God of our fathers, bless us with a threefold blessing written in the Torah by Moshe, your servant, and pronounced by Aharon and his sons, the Kohenim, your holy people, as it is said. May that I bless you and keep you. May it be your will. May that I make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May it be your will. And may that I turn his face towards you and establish peace with you. May it be your will. Yivarechecha Adonai veishmerecha Ken yehi ratzon Yair Adonai panavelecha vikuneka Ken yehi ratzon Yisa Adonai panavelecha veasem lecha Shalom Ken yehi ratzon In the name of Yeshua Meshachin Osa Shalom, Amen Halotz don't know who made them that look beautiful. Everyone, Baruch Atalonai, Eloheinu Melech Alam, 
Hamotzi lechem in hare. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth the bread from the earth. Amen. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you for those joining us online. We'll see you next Shabbat. Send your prayer request to our online server. Shabbat shalom. Have a great Shabbat.